nostrils, others having broken the stems of their pipes almost short off at the bowl, were vigorously puffing tobacco smoke, so that it constantly filled their olfactories. Stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's roundhouse abaft, and looking in that direction saw a fiery face thrust from behind the door, which was held ajar from within. This was the tormented surgeon, who, after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day, had betaken himself to the captain's roundhouse, cabinet he called it, to avoid the pest but still could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times. Marking all this, Stubb argued well for his scheme, and turning to the Guernsey man had a little chat with him, during which the stranger may expressed his detestation of his captain as a conceited ignoramus, who had brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle, sounding him carefully. Stubb further perceived that the Guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris. He therefore held his peace on that head, but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with him, so that the two quickly concocted a little plan for both circumventing and satirizing the captain, without his at all dreaming of distrusting their sincerity. According to this little plan of theirs, the Guernsey man, under cover of an interpreter's office, was to tell the captain what he pleased, but as coming from Stubb, and as for Stubb, he was to utter any nonsense that should come uppermost in him during the interview. By this time their destined victim appeared from his cabin. He was a small and dark, but rather delicate-looking man for a sea captain, with large whiskers and mustache, however, and wore a red cotton velvet vest with watch seals at his side. To this gentleman, Stubb was now politely introduced by the Guernsey man, who at once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them. What shall I say to him first? said he. Why, said Stubb, eyeing the velvet vest and the watch and seals, you may as well begin by telling him that he looks a sort of babyish to me, though I don't pretend to be a judge. He says, Monsieur, said the Guernsey man, in French, turning to his captain, that only yesterday his ship spoke a vessel, whose captain and chief mate, with six sailors, had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside. Upon this the captain started, and eagerly desired to know more. What now? said the Guernsey man to Stubb. Why, since he takes it so easy, tell him that now I have eyed him carefully. I'm quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale ship than a St. Jago monkey. In fact, tell him from me he's a baboon. He vows and declares, Monsieur, that the other whale, the tried one, is far more deadly than the blasted one. In fine, Monsieur, he conjures us, as we value our lives, to cut loose from these fish. Instantly the captain ran forward and in a loud voice commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles, and at once cast loose the cables and chains confining the whales to the ship. What now? said the Guernsey man, when the captain had returned to them. Why, let me see, yes, you may as well tell him now that, that, in fact, tell him I've diddled him, and, aside to himself, perhaps somebody else. He says, Monsieur, that he's very happy to have been of any service to us. Hearing this, the captain vowed that they were the grateful parties, meaning himself in mate, and concluded by inviting Stubb down into his cabin to drink a bottle of Bordeaux. He wants you to take a glass of wine with him, said the interpreter. Thank him heartily, but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man I've diddled. In fact, tell him I must go. He says, Monsieur, that his principles won't admit of his drinking, but that if Monsieur wants to live another day to drink, then Monsieur had best drop all four boats, and pull the ship away from these whales, for it's so calm they won't drift. By this time Stubb was over the side, and getting into his boat, hailed the Guernsey man to this effect. 
that having a long tow line in his boat, he would do what he could to help them, by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side, while the Frenchman's boats, then, were engaged in towing the ship one way, Stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way, ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long tow line. Presently a breeze sprang up. Stubb feigned to cast off from the whale, hoisting his boats. The Frenchman soon increased his distance, while the Pequot slid in between him and Stubbby's whale, whereupon Stubb quickly pulled to the floating body, and hailing the Pequot to give notice of his intentions, at once proceeded to reap the fruit of his unrighteous cunning. Seizing his sharp boat spade, he commenced an excavation in the body, a little behind the side fin. You would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea, and when at length his spade struck against the gaunt ribs, it was like turning up old Roman tiles and pottery buried in fat English loam. His boat's crew were all in high excitement, eagerly helping their chief, and looking as anxious as gold hunters. And all the time numberless fowls were diving, and ducking, and screaming, and yelling, and fighting around them. Stubb was beginning to look disappointed, especially as the horrible nosegay increased, when suddenly from out the very heart of this plague, there stole a faint stream of perfume, which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it, as one river will flow into and then along with another, without at all blending with it for a time. I have it, I have it, cried Stubb, with delight, striking something in the subterranean regions. A purse! A purse! Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in, and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap, or rich mottled old cheese, very unctuous and savory withal. You might easily dent it with your thumb, it is of a hue between yellow and ash color. And this, good friends, is ambergris, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Some six handfuls were obtained. But more was unavoidably lost in the sea, and still more, perhaps, might have been secured were it not for impatient Ahab's loud command to stub to desist, and come on board, else the ship would bid them good-bye. 